music brings me back, Tom. It's like a real, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Pavlovian response? Or am I just I, thinking of the dessert again? No, that's that's Viennetta. That's Viennetta. A, Vien, a, Viennese, a Viennese finger. There's a lot to be said for a Viennese finger. A lot to be said for a Viennese finger. Anytime I hear the music at the Tom and Jerry shows, like when I hear the Angelus, I just sort of pause and stop and turn. So if you're out there in podcast land and the music came on, we hope you paused, stopped and turned. No! But didn't turn no! the fucking dial off. We uh, or turn it on. The, most people listen while driving their fucking vehicles, Jerry. So if you don't mind, keep the head on point straight, but imaginarily come to a stop or pull over to a safe place and then come to a stop and listen to the start of the Tom and yes, Jerry indeed. show. And if you're driving a magic tractor, you can turn into a field. How oh, are you no! all keeping? How are you all keeping? It's the Tom and Jerry show back again. They said it shouldn't be done, but here we are. Uh, and what, uh, you know, it's good to know our intros are still as concise as they ever were, Tom. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear someone come to the show for the first time and listen to that first 45 seconds of audio and wonder what fucking alien transmission they you landed know, in on. It does. It, it, they say you should have a set intro every single time. These are the rules of programming and stuff like that. And you listen to the really big ones and they'll have a hello. And, and it'll be the exact same thing every time. And people apparently have a place of comfort with that. But there is not one fucking sinew in my body that will allow me to do it Jerry because I can't I can't on repetition yeah. I can't I can't. and it, also I wouldn't do it to you I wouldn't say, do it to you I want to keep you on your toes say you should do this and they say you should do that Tom they say you should do a fucking lots of the day I do none of it listen these are two what, talking what, two, what, what would two a men. serial what would a serial style intro to this uh, podcast sound like it was like Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, uh, no, I, I can't even do it. I can't no, even. I, I can't even bring. I can't fucking bring myself to do it. And as shout, hello, it's the podcast from Tom. But we should. We should at least now, three minutes in, uh, say who the hell we are. How are you all oh, yeah. doing? How are you all keeping? <laughs> welcome back to the Tom and Jerry Show if you're a long time fan, or welcome to the Tom and Jerry Show if you've just fell across us. I am Jerry McBride. He is Tom O'Mahony. How are we? Uh, Podcasters extraordinaire, it must be said. Comedians, uh, be they active or lapsed. Uh, <laughs> I'm Jesus currently. Jesus Christ, Jerry, you're like the Jason Bourne of fucking comedy. You're like you, uh, just, you go off the grid every so often, and then all of a sudden, then you come back and you kill a bunch of fucking people. Like Christ, you know, I, 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 I think I'm, I'm enjoying what's known as like a Ric Flair retirement. Like you know, I'm like that's it. I'm done. Never wrestling again. And then someone comes with a ball of money. I'm like, okay, yeah, okay, maybe lace up the boots one more time. <laughs> But right now, right now, I'm like, you know, enjoying my retirement, so to speak. Unless you have a gig going, who knows? Talk to me in the comments. Uh, and me and Tom have had a podcast, have had one of Ireland's longest running It actually is podcasts. one of the, I think that it was just, we were the podcast and then more happened and then it became a podcasts. So we were yeah. actually, I think we might've been the podcast. Yeah, we are on season seven, year number six. And I think this is like episode seven. Would you stop so, here, like, number we're six? Not, we're not Jerry, busy. We're co- the first podcast we did. I think we put together a, a push chair for your child, who is now oh, like God, you're right, driving. You're right. He's nearly going to discos at this. He's thing. an apprentice oh. electrician. Uh, <laughs> no, he's ten. Okay, so it's ten years ago. Holy shit, ten yeah. years, seven yeah. seasons. 70 episodes, seven episodes a year. So you can see we're not fucking rushing anything here, people. No, 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 no. Listen, there's some, the the, the, the thing in Barcelona, the, the family, Familia, that big church that's taken over 100 years. I don't yeah, know why I'm, I'm referencing. Still not finished. I'm not referencing correctly at all. But what I'm trying to say is, look at, they'll, they'll be on when they're on. And now that thankfully they're on. And yeah. if, if you have, we've changed format a few times. At least we're some way... You know, we haven't been absolutely stuck to our, stuck in the mud when it comes to that. But the last couple of seasons, we've been picking an obscure. I actually described this show this evening to a builder mate, and he his face just lit up with because he doesn't. He's only getting into podcasts, and he just you have a podcast. And I tell you now, I'm going to just record and explain what the Tom and Jerry show was, and when I explained like the Fred Dib- Dibna deep dive, the, <laughs> the how to build a house, he was like. But is it all I said, no it's not serious there's no. loads of dick jokes in, in between all of this like, ample dick jokes ample amounts of dick jokes we're silly silly people but we do pick a subject that's obscure enough that interests us to the point that we can talk for at least an hour sometimes two to three 
but we're going to try and curtail ourselves this yeah, week. Yeah, season because, seven, we're going to keep them around the error mark, Tom. I don't think people have it in them. <laughs> they don't have it in them for, for the, like, we're talking people knock a week out of them sometimes, and I can't, we can't be doing that to people. I if can't other, be doing other, that, no. We have other podcasts to be listened to, but we will, we'll be starting this season. I have a sofa to sit on. This is um, true. But as Tom says, the Tom and Jerry show uh, started off as a shite talking podcast and luckily has still retained a lot of that DNA to mm. say sharks have been around since the time of the dinosaurs, but they're not really the same sharks, but it's still a fucking shark if you get me, right? Uh, we have evolved into still a shite talking podcast, but we talk shite about just things we like. Exactly. So when we pick a subject, Jerry throws it at almost every subject Jerry has ever thrown at me or I've thrown at him. We're like, yeah, yeah, 100%. There's yeah. no, there's no, I don't can't think of one where we went, I don't know about that. Are people going to buy? Because we've picked subjects that we like. <laughs> exactly. And for, <laughs> for the, for the audience out there that likes them, thank you very much for listening. We're great to be back here for, uh, great to have you back here, I should say, for season seven. And we're going to kick it off, Tom, with a subject that was top of our list, nearly made it into season six, except we were too fucking lazy to tag on. It wouldn't, it episode. wouldn't, no, it wouldn't have gone right in season six. It wasn't right for season six. We'd done enough. Nostalgia. We had covered, with, yeah, we had, you know, uh, covered with, enough eighties based nostalgia exactly, from the yeah, north no, of this, England. Uh, <laughs> before before we do announce, well, you've you've already read the, read the title because I'm going to forget it for sure at the end. If you are listening on Spotify well, or whatever app, b- b- podcast you apps you are listening on, please give us a rating so that it spikes it back up again because you were great last year. You give it the five yes. stars on Spotify and it just spikes it back up in people's Next views. Two seconds. Exactly. If you are an Apple podcast, same. I think you can give a five stars or a thumbs up or a fucking sound. Fair play to you. And leave us a comment and follow us on all the usual platforms. McBride over there, oh man, here. Easy to find. Jerry, yeah. please tell the people what you're going to be absolutely pouring down our next this evening. This topic, Tom, is one that me and uh, you uh, both loved and we've chatted about a lot over the years. And we, we often asked in season six, would we get a full podcast out of it? And we kind of said that we would and we did and we just never did. But it was the prime choice to start off season seven with here. It is our love for an 80s game show based around darts called Bullseye. Bullseye. How could you have it? Was it Sunday evening? It was, it was indeed Sunday evening, Tom. I remember Bullseye being a Sunday evening thing. Now I am informed and I'm aware that as the years rolled on, it kind of got moved around and it got more like the um, it got more like the Saturday afternoon uh, before Gladiator's spot. Oh, yes. Yeah, you yeah. Know, blind date then to be on after. Blind date kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, in in my youth, Bullseye was a Sunday evening show. I seem to recall it coming in around about tea time or thereabouts, and it was a nice little cap off to the week that, okay, Glenrow always seemed like a bit of a death knell to the weekend. That was, uh, I, 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 I talked about this, the death knell bl- or the, the Glenrow Blues knew you that you had school the next day. Where in the world might pick you up a small bit, all right, because Teresa Lowe was gorgeous. And I think everybody fancied her, not that we cared anything about, you know, geography or whatever else but yeah, we didn't give a fuck where in the world we were <laughs> but before that you had your last of the summer wine and you had your <laughs> uh you had your bullseye and again tom i don't know what it is that like you know we irish people are drawn to northerners no i was just gonna say northern north english England, people i think class english people i think it's just like you know it, it we can we're like okay yeah no them londoners and all them fucking uh thatcher and all that kind of crack no clearly Clearly pricks, but like the Northerners are working class in this team, I guess. All right, maybe you could have a pint with them. Maybe not the squaddies, but uh, the miners. Yeah, I listen, I've gigged enough in the north of England, uh, north. and uh, I can confirm exactly what you think. They think like we think because for the longest time, they've never felt attached to London in much in the same way that we've never felt attached to London, even though technically we were for, but there seems to be they're on board with the yes. ship we're into and they're they're blue collar down to earth people listen we have our absolute bell ends here who wouldn't have a care in the world for a ball pin hammer or a fucking you know a self tapping fucking screw we have those too yeah. but it would seem northerners for some reason we do enjoy yeah. talking about them watching uh, them uh, yeah, and, and if you're a listener from uh, London uh, the feud is over you know <laughs> Thank you for your listenership. We're sure you're signed too. But uh, if you're wondering uh, why it is uh, uh, me and Tom have such a, a 
an attachment to Bullseye, or why indeed two people are talking about a game show 30 years after the fact. Um, maybe you've never heard of Bullseye, or maybe you're right here going, yeah, fuck yeah, Bullseye. If you've watched Bullseye, you're going to know what we're talking about. If you've never seen Bullseye before in your life, well, listen along, please, for the next hour. We're going to tell you all the things we loved about it, and you can watch a whole load of episodes of it on YouTube if you're so inclined. Yeah. Or if you stick on, like, Challenge or Dave or some shit like that around about 11 o'clock at night, you're, you're bound to fall across a couple of episodes. But, Tom, we're going to uh, we're gonna take a little... Uh, a little dive into Bullseye and how it made the mark on our lives that only a flying dart could make. Oh, like, Jesus Christ, 100 nights, eh? I gotta tell you. Uh, again, when we say Sunday evenings, Tom, like every Sunday evening, it seems, even though that uh, Bullseye ran in its original form from 1981 to 1995. Now, I was born in 1980, Tom. So obviously I wasn't um, sitting in the ashes watching Bullseye as a one-year-old. But by the time I came up to four and five and six, it had just become a part of of, of life. Uh, most seasons were 30 episodes long. So it was basically the whole year. Like it, it was 30 Sundays was of 30? the year. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Most of, most of them were like 24 to, 24 to 30 episodes long. Uh, I heard I heard the host Jimbo more on him in a second. I heard him saying that they would basically come in. They did it like deal or no deal. Yeah. And I, I suppose a lot of other game shows as well, I guess the chase does it as well, is that they would come in and film like four episodes in a day and do that every day for a fortnight or three weeks and then just fuck off for the rest of the year. Like that, well, you were done for the year. Of course they were. And Jim, I mean, so Jim was just, imagine as a comic landing that gig. Just come in, bash it out, do two or three of them a day, ship out an audience, ship in a new audience, bash them all out, and, and, and just kept that going for 14 years. So it went from I was a child... Jesus Christ! Until I was 15 years old. And Tom, I'm sure you were you were probably about 14. I know you're about a year younger than me. Hey, yeah. Tom, do you, want to, do you want to hear something that really fucking weirded me out? Oh, I, I, I don't know. Jesus. Go on. It's just, you know, it's a way of thinking. You know, I'm 42 now, okay? Mm -hmm. Fresh-faced, as you can see. Beautiful. I was born... 11 years after the moon landing. Jesus. You were, born you were born 12 years after the moon landing. Holy fuck. Because that feels a weird like forever. Way. It's a weird way of looking at it, isn't it? Like literally there's the pyramids, Eiffel Tower, moon landing. That's history. Yeah. That's and it. I'm like, the moon landing, oh, well, my dad wasn't born for it. Yeah, he was. My dad was a grown ass man. He could have driven the fucking thing. He could, uh, yeah. He could have commentated on it. Fuck. I'm sure he did. That's weird. It's a weird way of looking at it, isn't it? Ah, fuck you anyway, Jerry. That's the end of the podcast. You're after ruining my fucking evening. Anyway. But then, like, you know, I could turn around and say I was also born, like, 17 years after Kennedy was killed. And I was like, yeah, that sounds about right. But for some no, reason, it doesn't. It, 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 that sounds about right. No. Yeah, that sounds about right. But for some reason, 11 years since the moon landed last, Listen, year, last night, we just don't... left me lying awake looking at the fucking ceiling until three. I don't think we morning. become sentient until we're about fucking 13 or 14 anyway. You know, till you've seen... You've seen a couple of movies in the cinema and stuff like that. You become fully sentient and you think back because even your kids are going to think back and go, well, fuck me. I was born just fucking 11 or 12 years after 9-11. And in their head, in their yeah. 30s and 40s, they're going to go, that was clearly a million years ago. Oh, yeah. When people yeah. still bothered flying in planes, they couldn't just transport themselves on a fucking Star trek -y thing, which your kids, our kids will be able to do. Just yeah. to, to just a planet that we haven't destroyed. We're getting anyway. off top. We're getting off point. <laughs> this is what happens if you're this new to the Tom and Jerry show. We can only apologize. These one hour podcasts have ran to three hours with this Ariane. So here's the thing with here's the thing with Bullseye. Before we get into Bullseye, we first have to get around the sport that it's based around, which is mm -hmm. darts, throwing yeah. darts in a pub. If you've ever been in a pub, chances are you've been in a pub that has a dartboard on it. If you haven't been in a pub that has a dartboard in it, there's one next door. It's just a very simple a uh, pub game if you need me to explain it uh, i can't you throw darts at a board i can't i can't you, you, you score scores first to go, go from 501 to, to zero wins a frame and there you go that's forward, that's the you simplest go. way start both start off at 501 first to zero that's and there's it. been there's been darts for many and many years but it seems to be tom the darts hit a particular stride in the 1980s along with snooker uh, and bowls as well and uh the reason for this uh, you know you would hear apocryphal stories of it is that the advent of color television meant that um 
people needed more colourful sports to, to show on them. For example, snooker was a great one that never really worked in black and white because you couldn't tell the colour of the balls from each other. But when it came along with colour television, all of a sudden snooker popped. And in the 80s, all of a sudden snooker was hot shit. You and me grew oh, up. Oh, everybody was buying well, a waistcoat. Everybody was buying a waistcoat. You know, everybody was seven chalking the thing, chalking the queue like you knew what the you fuck were sitting, that meant. You were sitting at home as a child in a waistcoat smoking Benson and Hedges. With my uh, mother's glasses turned upside down on the end of my nose like <laughs> Dennis Taylor. Because <laughs> you had the, su- the s- snooker superstars. Try that a couple of times on a podcast, Hung. You had the snooker superstars of the day of your Steve Davises and your Hurricane Higgins and your... John, John Harris Paris. And, and 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 so on and so forth. So like it was big noise. I mean, it was a it was a very easy sport to film. You didn't need multiple cameras running around the place like a football game or cricket or anything like that. I'm sure it was certainly cheap to cover, cheaper than um, first division football, which was probably very expensive. You had a lot of players to 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 pay, a lot of cash to fo- to fall out. But snooker, I'd imagine, was quite cheap to to get on TV. Um, and the, the characters that inhabited it just made it like, you know, it was like, you know, it was like the WWF, you know, you had these larger than life, Alex Hurricane Higgins, everyone Hurricane Higgins. nickname. And he's smoking you know, like 50 Benson Hedges during the game. Like, Steve yeah. Davis was like the thoughtful youngster, fresh face, the complete antithesis of it and, and, and all this kind of thing. And so be it as well with darts. It was a really easy, uh, thing to show on TV. It was, it was, um, I don't know about you, Tom, but, uh, something about turn-based sports that i really love i'm not so i'm not so big on like two teams of football just clashing together in the middle of the field and whatever happens but like a turn-based sports like darts like i'll take a turn yeah 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 you take a turn and i'll take a turn and you take a turn we're just gonna go at this i never thought about like turn yeah turns you i take a turn you take a turn i'll take a turn you know lawn bowls i fucking love lawn bowls i'm I'm gonna roll a ball i'm gonna roll a ball down here okay now you take a go no, oh, I I just, oh, sorry, no, I'll take get a go seven minutes after your ball finally yeah, gets to the end of it. Oh, no, very no, 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 it's, it's, it's... We grew up in the 80s when there was no AS, ASMR gang, you know what I mean? Like, we had to just watch what lawn bowls just, like, real quiet. <laughs> just rolling bowls, over the grass. Just... Rolling up the bays. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so, so be it with, with darts. Darts was hot shit coming out of the 70s. Uh, with the advent of color television, it was um, it was uh, easy, to, easy to film, easy to get a crowd going. And to this day... Uh, darts uh, is is hot shit now and somebody uh, had a great idea of why don't we take one of these slow methodical turn-based sports and combine it with general knowledge and make a quiz show yeah and uh while snooker got its turn a little bit later uh with that exact format uh, and we'll talk about that at the end we will darts beat it to the punch with a show devised by two guys called Andrew Wood and Norman Vaughn. And that show, Tom, is the subject of our podcast today, Bullseye. It definitely the boys were having pints playing darts. For sure. For sure they were having yeah. pints playing darts going. We just put the table quiz that's happening in that room over there. Combine it with this. That is, I guarantee, I guarantee that is what it was. For sure. Was pub quiz over there. And it was like, I, I, you know, I bet you this, I bet you that. I bet, you know, I'll bet you. Bet you ten pounds, I'll get one eighty on the next one. A little bit of gambling, okay? You did, you win, okay? Yeah. What's that over there? What's the, where, where, where? What two countries did the Suez Canal uh, go through? Uh, it, it was just this sort of. There you go. Smash them together, and uh, the guys Andrew, um, Andrew Wood, and Norman Vaughn, who was a comedian in his own right, although not one that I'm wildly familiar Tom, uh, they devised, sold and made this show called bullseye so let's make the show tom right let's let's right. let's make the show let's so, have the rules so first the whole what, what, well before what, we even get before we get to the to the to the rules tom we need a format before format we need a format we need that's a what host. we need we need yeah. a host for this show we need somebody that can take this show to the public and that man was not jim bowen no, Jim Bone said he was like fifth choice or something. Jim Bone was fifth down the line. Now, he never <laughs> said who was the first four that beat him to it. But eventually, the honor of hosting Bullseye fell to an English comedian called Jim Bone, who would have been kind of known at the time from a show on ITV, which was Bullseye's eventual home, called The Comedian's Tom, which was a little bit too early in, 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 in the... Um, in the run for, for 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 me to have seen it, but the comedians would have had Jim Bowen and Bobby Davro and yeah. uh, this uh, Lionel Blair and all this kind of um, 
All, all this sort of uh, level all of eighties. The workman's where, club where, is where yeah, are yeah, they yeah. now? Actors, yeah. yeah, actors. I say comedians that eventually went on to get their own um, their own uh, shows uh, down the line. Like Bobby Davro had a show, the Cannon and Balls, and all this kind of thing of this world had a show. And the guy in question was indeed Jim Bowen. No spring chicken at this time, Tom. He was born in nineteen thirty-seven. So do this quick thumbs there. 43, 41. But he looked aged, Jerry. He looked 40, ancient even from the first one. He did forty-one, look, Tom. I mean, if we if we've no. listened to this podcast all along, he was thirty when the moon landing happened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but he was—he was a fucking—he he, he, he was, was old like a, looking, wasn't he? Like he just ever see the, old. Yeah. Do you ever see the Twitter accounts of footballers in the eighties? And it's all these um all these lads that are like twenty-five and they've got like no hair and fucking collie comb overs. They shit. mounted him up comb overs. <laughs> comb like Jim kind of shit, had yeah. a bit of a comb over, and he'd big Nana glasses on. Yeah, and big. He'd, Deirdre Barlow glasses, yes. And, and he and sounded like an old fellow when he spoke. Like, the kind of semi-inappropriate a lot of the time, the shit he was coming up. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. He, he, was, he, was a, he was a comedian, Tom. We're going to get into it in a little second where he cut his teeth. But he was a comedian first and foremost. And then this is said, can you, can you, can you, we, we, we know from your experience working on the show, the comedians, that you can, you know, you can do in, in front of a live studio audience and you can, uh, I'm sure you've heard the expression, Tom, you can find a camera, you know what mm. I mean? You can, yeah. you can not have your, be standing there talking to the fucking wall, you know, you, you have good stage presence and all that kind of thing. So if we just give you questions on a card, uh, the rest is, is, is down to you. Uh, and he said, yes, I absolutely could, can do that. And as we'll come to find out, Tom, no, he probably couldn't. No, he couldn't. But, you know, who paper won't refuse ink, don't you know? Hey, interesting uh, tidbit on, uh, on 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 Jim himself. Yeah. Jim Bowen's not his real name, Tom. No, sir. He was born Peter Williams, don't you know? Uh, but then they didn't keep that name. He changed his name to James Whitaker. Yeah, what? Oh, James Whitaker. Yeah, James Whitaker. He was born Peter Williams, but he was um, put up for adoption by his mom. I don't know if he ever met his mom ever again. Uh, that's not on Wikipedia. Maybe I'll just add it in. People can do that. Nice. Yes, he did. Happy ending. Who knows? Uh, but no, he was born... Uh, um, Peter Whitaker, and then changed his name to, sorry, beg your pardon, born Peter Williams, and then changed his name Whitaker. to James Whitaker. And then why uh, to Bowen? Well, his... just for a stage name, uh, I believe I read it on Wikipedia that his, uh, well, he got Jim from James. As yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and his, I think his wife was called Brown, and his grandmother was called Owens. So he put them together and got Bowen. Oh, that's, do you know what it is? It's a bit more of a working class sounding name than Whitaker too, isn't it? Uh, well, like you're not for Rotten Hubs. I was remi- I was reminded when I was looking that up, Tom. That um, it's one thing that that is it, it's a stage name. I kind of knew Jim Bowen was a stage name, and okay, James, you know that uh, James um Whitaker kind of okay, and then he's like, no, Peter Williams. I'm like this fucker has three three names. He's like face from the A <laughs> team. This is this is fact. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay some knowledge on the. This is the, this is bonus knowledge you fuckers get the audience of the Tom and Jerry show. The face from the A team. Tom, his real name is. Is uh, I Templeton Peck. Templeton Peck, well spotted, sir. Yes. Well done, that man. But I, that's I not don't his know name. where in my Rolodex brain that came from. Right now, and that I didn't, I didn't cut that people. That's but that's in there. Real that's time. in there somewhere. You know that face from wow. the A team's real name is Templeton Peck, but that's not his real name. Of course, it's not his real name. Not his real name. His real name is Alvin Brenner. But yes. He chose the name Templeton Peck. He was raised Alvin Brenner and chose the name Templeton Peck as an alias when he joined the army. But then come to find out his fucking real name's not Alvin Brenner either. He was born Richard Bancroft and put up for adoption where the name Alvin Brenner was putting him. And then he chose Templeton Peck and he's just more commonly known as Face. So and there you go. He went on to host a TV show about his own darts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> but Jim was uh, Jim was uh, he was um, a teacher. Tom, he was like a, he was a PE teacher that came out of the army. So Jim Bowen as a PE teacher. Yeah. Oh yes. Fucking yeah. look what you could have won, Tom. Look what um, you could have won. All right, kids. <laughs> On the beep test. Look what you could have won. You <laughs> failed yourself. You're gonna you're gonna amount to nout. I'm afraid. The, um, he was a, he was a PE teacher and then went on to be like a deputy headmaster. He might have actually been a real headmaster for all that. But then dabbled in the school drama and uh, that lent itself to a career as a stand-up comedian. Apparently, apparently that's the career path back in the day. It's not just fucking have a go when you're 27 like you and me. Yeah. Uh, and and he cut his teeth 
in the working man's club. Oh, he's all that. Like I've watched, I've watched specials of his, and I've you, I've seen. Yeah, like, he, I, he, he, a fierce, that, but, like fierce, let's, charming, let's, fierce, very charming, charming uh, very charming, very affable, and all this kind of thing. But let's talk about the working men's clubs of England, Tom. Because I've heard that time and time again. Usually in a derogatory sense, where oh, it's a very working man's club kind of comedy, and I never really kind of questioned what the working man's club was. Which is ironic because the workman's club in Dublin is actually. <laughs> It's it's quite a it's quite a hip liberal left right. kind of place, which yeah. wouldn't be what you'd associate the the workmen's clubs of not the really. northern not England the, of the eighties of northern England of the eighties, well, but like the workmen's clubs of the eighties, um, Tom, are not even the eighties because they go back to like the eighteen hundreds, possibly course they earlier. Do, yeah. Um, they were originally designed uh, to keep working men out of the pubs. Yeah, that hilarious. Uh, and uh, let's see how that turned out. Uh, they, 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 they were originally designed to, to keep them out of the pubs. It was a working man's club, so it was more like a, a social place to come in and have a crack. And they were a place of education. So it was like, you know, come in and we might teach you how to fucking weld. And, you know, it was kind of like false coursey kind of thing. Okay, a little bit right, of, right, 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 you know, right, right, yeah. You know, kind of come in and like, you know, okay, you're you're there like doing dog's body work well how you're only a young lad how about we educate you up a wee bit now maybe you can be like an electrician or something or maybe like you know further yourself and better yourself and you know stay off to drink uh but fuck me now that we're all here now i find find myself with a very thirsty does anybody have any material or maybe some tools anyway, anybody... that we could put together a bar shaped object I'm, ju- I'm, I'm just spitballing here guys and while we have a bar there is anybody get anybody getting a little fucking sing song going or something there now for the crack a couple of yeah. boys get a guitar in the corner there my old man but not every it. night but not every night of the week maybe maybe we have a comedian here every tort or some shit like that yeah that's yeah, that's yeah, how it evolved yeah, yeah. tom that's how it evolved like someone decided that like hey if we have hundreds of men in the one place uh every night of the week when the Lock off from work and they go to the working man's club for uh, to socialize and fucking talk about the miserable drudge that their working lives are. Like, fuck it, sell them a couple of pints. Why not? And I while they're there, the idea you know, is it's kind of like, you know, in the, 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 what do they call them in America? You know, when it's like, it's not a call, it's, what are they called? Oh, it's, you know, they wear beaver hats and stuff like oh, that. Oh, like the, the lodges. Lodge. The, the yeah, Mason yeah, yeah. Lodge. Of the, it the... Masony, like it, it was yeah. probably started off with that notion and then all of a sudden drink entered it and it was like. And then drink and entered then, the. Before the you know it, Nora is wearing tassels on her nipples and she's doing a dance for exactly. everybody. I you mean, know, raising a few pounds the... for a lad that needs a wheelchair. That's the that's the that's the evolution of these things that you know we can sell these lad lads pints and pie and chips or whatever it might be, and then fuck it while they're here maybe we'll throw on a bit of entertainment for them, so we'll throw on you know like bands, singer songwriters, fucking get a magician in one night. What the hell? The next night we'll get comedians and the comedians all of a sudden started to get regular book gigs in these working men's clubs down through the years where they would have their comedy slot. Every Thursday night or every Friday night, whatever it was, that was comedy night. And you're playing to a predominantly male audience, exclusively working class. So none of your fucking fancy alternative comedy. Um, Just play the hits, you know, get the laughs and such like. And I guess like down through the years, you know, um, some places would have sort of said, OK, we'll go for like the low rent base humor, you know. Yeah. How do they vote around here? We'll yeah, lean well, into that. Well, I mean, uh, the likes of Bernard Manning apparently was incredible in that he would go and do that. He apparently he was he was like you could tell he was super talented, but he was super crude and so super crude, it, super it racist. Was, it was all apparently for this character he was building. And this is talking to somebody that worked with him before as a producer. I said he was oh no, he was a phenomenon. He could go and do a gay club and do gay material. Unbelievably, he'd go acro- and he'd go across town and do an hour of clean material for a corporate, and then he'd go to the workmen's club at the part where there'd be a big workmen's club that would be paying him thousands, and he'd go and do the foulish. He could do three vastly different shows in one night. I've only and heard all- the one, Tom. Yeah, this was it. And you see, the o- the only one being televised and the one that paid the most was that character, and he was happy to play it because in his head he was an actor, he was a performer, and it was that's who that was who he was playing, and that's who he's. He's paying them, and before you know it, when they're paying, and you're filling pa- huge theaters, paper won't, re- paper won't refuse ink. 
and it was acceptable at the time to say the kind of shit he was saying. Well, this know? is it too. And and as we we'll, as we we'll, as we'll come to down the line, like you know, it's the ruin of many a, a man. Not jumping ahead and anything like that, but it, it was determined that this, these working men club, working men's clubs, were boorish and and you know racist and and uh, homophobic go and all this kind of all this kind of shit. Uh, but what it did produce, for good or for ill, was a uh, raft of comedians at the time. Again, your your previously mentioned Hale and Paces, your Cannon and Balls, your Bobby Davros. And you, people could be listening to going, like, who the fuck are these people that you're talking about? These are the people that were on TV five nights a week yeah. in our youth, Tom. Uh, and and we, we, we didn't have social media at the time to check what Cannon and Balls politics were at the time. So Hale and Pace. Uh, they were just like funny people on the telly doing hosting game shows and hosting quizzes and shit like this. And so be it, which and not for nothing as well, Tom. To see them working men's clubs with the comedy uh, hours on them. Uh, people say, yeah, well, how would you make a living out of that? There was about 4,000 of them in the country. Yeah, that was a thing. And people would fucking go. And like, they wanted a comedian every single Thursday night. Yeah. So it was it, it, it really did lads cut their teeth and if you're going to work those clubs you are going to come out bulletproof like by oh, the time you're going to you know that's that's what that's what came to to, to pass with with jim as we go on here now with um with um with bullseye like he could he could uh, work a crowd he could roll with the punches he could allow himself to get heckled and they could keep things back on track like you know you know the actual reading of question cards and shit like that yeah. stumped him every now and then but he could just sort of take a punch and, and and roll on with it and make light of it and make fun of it and 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 get a good rapport with people because again tom like it was just training he was working in these working men's clubs every week possibly every night of the week around the country just going around uh just repetition tom it's just well, reps could, isn't you, it it's just you rotation. could see it you could see it. I remember he was you know the the, the poor awkward couple I'm jumping ahead of you now because you're going to explain the game the format but the couple yes. would come out they might be two buddies like a decent arts player and but the couple would come out the knowers the knower would come and he says and what do you do? and the women always had these Dennis Taylor glasses they were literally like two television screens bolted to the front of their face with these fucking scaffold bars up the side and he go and what do you do yourself love and she like I'm a housewife oh housewife they, they don't do it after. housewife uh, that's good now because you know they don't have to do much these they do they and he'd turn to the audience and of course everybody would be on it and it'd be him in the audience for 30 seconds and he'd turn back and basically elbow you one of the guts and like oh, only joking love only joking and in fairness she knew he was only joking she loved she was like the same woman was like you bastard you know yeah. she didn't get, she didn't really get it's it. nice to be on telly nice to be on telly it, I, here it was a, there was at one point and again I'm getting ahead but just because I'll forget it there was a five-year waiting list to be in this the audience. Is it. To be in We're the gonna, audience, Jerry. We are going to get into all this, Tom. How popular this goddamn show is that we are still talking about it 30 fucking years later. But before we get into that, let's talk to the rest of the crew because we have Jim there. Mm -hmm. First time hosting a TV uh, show. Um <laughs> A TV quiz show. He was already on the. Uh, he was already on the comedians. It was the first time hosting a, t hosting a TV show, and I believe the first couple of years this guy wasn't around. But after a little while, they said we need another voice on this, so they brought in Tony Green, who was by himself a professional darts player, but he was also a darts commentator. Yeah, he they was. Brought yeah, him yeah, in. yeah, yeah. They brought him in to be the. I keep saying referee, but I suppose umpire is a better word for it, Tom. Umpire? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, was he, he was kind of the the, the scorekeeper. If, scorekeeper. if you imagine, do you remember George Doors on uh, yes. Shooting Stars? Yes. What are the what are the scores, George Doors? But 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 shut up, you fat cow! I'm eating a scone. The scores are or Rieker, you know. And he yeah. was that to. It was a good idea to keep him because, in fairness, Jim kind of Jim was kind of shite in a brilliant way, but he needed some legitimacy. The, the, do you the, know what it, I mean? It, it seems to me that after the first couple of um. The first couple of years of Bullseye, when Jim was having to do any, everything, ask questions, keep count, keep scores, because Jim would be uh, uh, beside the board doing the whole treble 19, all this kind of crack. But it, it was clear it was kicking his ass to do fucking hard sums in his head. So uh, they got in Tony to, to, to do the scores and, and point people around the place. And Tony Green uh, really was that sort of special sauce to bullseye and him oh, was, and yeah. jim's sort of um rapport and they'd come on at the start of the show and they'd have little sort of back and forths and do little bits and skits kind of at and deck but like you don't hate them yeah uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
<laughs> so now we've got a good ass show going. We've got a host. We've got a concept. We've got a studio audience full of people. So what do we need next, Tom? We need contestants. Yeah, we need contestants. And as you said yourself, there was a five year waiting list to be in the audience for Bullseye at its peak. And the list to actually be a contestant on it was nearly that long. Now, here's another. Here's the thing I want to say about Bullseye before we go any further that it was a ground up success, Tom. It was a completely new concept that the makers of Bullseye came up with. A lot of the quiz shows that we would have known at the time, uh, Play Your Cards spin-offs. Right, for example. Yeah, they were just. They, 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 were, they were redos of, of American shows. Play Your Cards Right was a thing called Card Shark in America in the 70s. And then they just said, okay, take it over here and stick Bruce Forsyth on it. Uh, um, Price is Right is an American concept. Yeah. Wheel of Fortune. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, God, there's it, more. There's, there's more. more. There is more. But family fortunes. I beg your pardon. Family fortunes. That's what I was trying to think of. Family fortunes was called family feud in the America and 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 the America. You know that one. Uh, and the the came about in the fifties. So they just took and, re- and and redone it and and, and planted it in in British TV. So it was sort of like you know, okay, we'll take it over here and we'll stick like Bruce Forsyth. Everybody loves Bruce. Tried and tested. So Bullseye was really sort of like a shot in the dark. They weren't really certain that it was going to be the runaway hit that it was. But I think like the concept of it is so baked in the in the sort of working class north of England um, style, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Gary, like the, they were giving away a few pound. And of course they were giving away a few this pounds. Is... So let's, <laughs> let's let's talk about the people that we uh, seen on 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 Bullseye. You needed two contestants, Tom, okay? So we're mm-hmm. going to get into the game here itself for people that have never known. I, all you know now is that uh, uh, a host that may or may not be racist uh, hosting it and a guy counting at the side, and it was a rip-roaring success. But let's talk about the people that are playing this goddamn game, Tom, okay? Yep. Uh, you had two people per team, yes. three teams per show for six people for the whole goddamn thing. Uh-huh. Uh, each team comprised of uh, a darts player. A thrower. A thrower, as they were known in later yeah. episodes, and uh, a question answerer. The knower. The knower. <laughs> I love the known. thrower and the knower. The thrower and, and the knower. with these fucking catchphrases throughout. Oh. So the throwers and the knowers, and I think I think throwers and knowers were like a, a development in, in like the late or maybe even the reboot of Bullseye, but I'm going to stick with them now because that's just fucking bang on, okay? So you would have your thrower who would be the guy that would play darts, so sometimes it was a lady, and you would have your knowers who would sit and answer questions, and the two kind of work together to get as much money out of Jim Bowen's pocket by the end of the night as you, as you could get. It was rare, Tom. It was very rare to see, for example, contestants from London on this show. You, yeah, I swear to God, there was nobody. <laughs> in all the bits I can remember, there was nobody that wasn't from Jim's neck of the woods. No. Do you they, know what I mean? They all had, they all had various they all northern, had that wigan... north of England accents. If you were to do any of the accents, they would all just sound like like Fred Dibna. Yeah, uh, Tom. It's just like your wallpaper <laughs> accent. I love, for that whole... I love pie. I love pies. <laughs> Um, and sorry to any but people from the thing is about British people, they love when you point out stereotypes. They love it. They love it. They love it. Not after a while, they get sick of it. All right. But it is funny that we they did and they would pick up and and if they weren't, they certainly weren't London people. Do you know, they were normal Definitely people not. from the Midlands who there just was a lot ha- of there was a lot of there was a lot of sort of um, when we say working class people from the north of England, what we really kind of mean, Tom, and what was kind of. Not explicitly called out, but it was a lot of like minors. Yeah. Uh, and I don't mean children. I mean like the fuckers <laughs> who dug the shit out of the who wall. Dug coal the out of the ground or iron or whatever the hell it was. Steel workers in Sheffield and all this kind of crack. And in the mid 80s, Tom, of course, you had the miners strike. Yes. And I'm not going to sit here and get all political and tell you exactly what was going on in the miners strike because I didn't really understand it as a child. And I'm not going to say I understand everything about it now. It's kind of like the Falklands War. I have the gist of it, but like I didn't know, you know. Watch The Crown if you want to know about those things. Yeah, I think not... it was Tories against blokes with dirty necks. I guess exactly. You know, that's ba- the... Basically, it was it was the established uh, conservative government with Thatcher at the at power that was putting the boot heels to the miners, closing mines left, right, and center, and the miners went and strike so that they wouldn't close mine. Seems a bit of a gamble if you ask me, Tom. I mean, I guess that's you're going to close the mine, so thanks for not being in them. 
There's a lot I don't understand about labor and commerce. I Listen, guess. all I know is that there are dwarfs that mine. That's all I know. Then they've got awesome beards. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. How well, these, 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 these guys certainly weren't like mythical uh, creatures, Tom. These were like... Swinging axes, little, no. These were like little... Uh, they, they were like little uh, pot-bellied, curly-haired uh, <laughs> dudes. Uh, but the, the the reason I bring up the fact that there was a lot of striking miners in the in the uh, in the in the who would enjoy a pint and play darts and be good at it and would be looking to make a few pound in a very very difficult time in their lives. No, we can't imagine uh, like the fucking horrendous conditions that were going on in the north of England during the miner strike. No money coming in, fucking families to rear and all this nah. kind of thing. But Jim would t- would 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 chat to them at the at the start of the show, and there was a lot of times like I'm not working at the moment, or what do you do for a living? Well, I'm not working at the moment, or yeah. I'm a miner. And and Jim would just have like so much sort of like that's kind of where the compassion. Oh, I didn't beg your pardon. That's not where the compassion ends. That's where the compassion starts. He would just yeah. sort of not make. He would not, you know, push them on that. He would not say, "Oh, you're not working at the minute. Oh, what are you doing? What would you like to do?" All that. He just kind of. It was kind of told and untold. Like, okay, I understand. Don't push this question. Which this, is this is something you would almost, I'd say, would be a prerequisite of going on most of the TV shows is that you have some sort of profession to say, because nobody, yeah. they don't want you looking at a television and seeing unsuccessful people. You know what I mean? They, they, the, you know, you're, but, you're not going to get someone on fucking strike at Lucky. Go, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm on the picket line, Michael, uh, at the minute, <laughs> getting fucking stomped down by the bobbies on a nightly basis. And, Those jackbooted uh, bastards. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I spend eight hours of my day screaming at scabs crossing the picket line. You know, uh, I'll take <laughs> two from the top and three from the bottom. There, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> But that's where that's where I think the warmth of the show came is that there's, it was, there's just an authenticity was, and, a, and a niceness and a warmth to it and and like from you know from the ground up it was nothing it really like was. any other show but and, it was and more than, so it, easy it, it, you wanted these people to win money yeah. and, and do well I don't know what it is I mean now when I watch like people on the chase or anything like that I'm like you have enough money fuck off you know yeah, fuck off so tell us what uh, so we we so we've a nor a gore on each team there's three teams so that's six people we have Jim Tony hosting the show commentating on the show and we've got a dartboard tom a dartboard we got you'll have heard a bully too uh that's what oh, bully shit, how could i yeah, forget yeah. bully. bully bully was the mascot of bullseye and he was an animated bull and this bull could he would do ever he, he could would drive a up. bus <laughs> he, <laughs> he could would pop up he would pop up like do you remember years ago when you play Mortal Kombat for like nine hours straight and every so <laughs> often this head would pop in of this bloke and go and pop back up it, it was just to break your from turning into a psychopath based in trying to, you know, throw throw scorpion spears at somebody. Bully was almost like that. He'd pop up between rounds just on the screen as an animator go. Oh, it, 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 they, <laughs> they had this little animated bull with like a dart short on him. Yeah, and yeah, he, yeah. a red and white stripy dart short. And he would, as Tom says there, he would punctuate things. He would, um, in spelling questions, if, 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 if he needed to spell it, he would walk across the screen leafing through a dictionary he would stick his nose up if you ran if you took too long to answer a question believe oh <laughs> bully was your man bully bully was the fucking glue that held this together in possibly, all fairness he really possibly was. he was the ronald mcdonald hooves he was the, the ronald mcdonald of of bullseye essentially right um, so let's I've... play let's play bulls uh-huh. okay, so. every show was a half hour long time okay right oh. and the first easily Easily ten minutes of that was devoted to meeting the guests. If you could, <laughs> like, God damn, there are six people for Jim to introduce, and he will bring them on and talk to them at fucking length for what seems like a painfully long amount of time. I remember as a child, Tom, being like, "Will you just please start playing the game? Will you just please?" For the they did not want to be talking to those poor people. They no. did not want to be talking to Jim. They are rabbits in the headlight, and this is this is where Jim's experience as a compare and an MC and a, and a comedian comes into it because he's here trying to drag a bit of crack out of these people and getting stonewalled. Like you, we've all been doing gigs, Tom. We're like, so where are you from? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Time, time. Move on, move on, move on, move on. What do you work on? Oh, a job. Okay, fuck me. I'm having no crack here with you. But Jim was like able again, not talk down to them. Uh, it was very clear that he just like had this real sort of like. A uh, cool uncle, not even cool uncle. Like, hey, I've got a sports car. Just sort of like, oh yeah, you know, here's a five. I'll go get yourself sweets. Go get yourself chips or whatever. It is. That's what he was like. He's like a nice uncle. He was just like a nice uncle, just a fucking who nice liked dude. to drink. He struck and, me as a fellow who liked to drink. 
And you know what? He, uh, he 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 got the gays in and he settled them down. You could see these people were just like, holy shit, I haven't seen this many lights in my face since the fucking police dragged me in for being on the strike and got me to sign a confession by beating <laughs> the shit out of me. <laughs> you know, it just settled everybody down and made sure nobody's Deirdre Barlow glasses were steaming up. And then we get into the game itself. Yes. Sam. The game is fucking remarkably simple. You've got a uh, specially built dartboard with topics all the way around it. Okay. So they're all sort of general knowledge topic. You could go around it you know, your history, showbiz, Britain, current affairs or whatever like that. And within that, you had segments for how much money you would get for landing on that. So it was like 30, 50 or a hundred pounds. Okay. So uh-huh. you could say, um, the knower, and we're going to stick with that, uh, that would say, I'd like to answer a question on sport. Right. So Jim would say, all right, okay. And the dart thrower of that team would throw a dart at the board, trying to aim for the sport segment. Right. And, you know, if he, if he, if he hit the sport segment, but far out, this question was worth 30 pounds. Nearer to it, 50, nearer to it, 100. Nearer to the bullseye, 50, nearer to the bullseye, 100. So ideally it'd be like, you know, nice near the bullseye. So this question's worth 100 pounds. If you answer it, you get 100 pounds. Right. Couldn't be simpler. Now, it was only one dart per segment, Tom. So if I got Britain, for example, if I wanted to answer questions on like the lakes of Britain or whatever like that, we got Britain, okay, and then your team came along and your dart landed in Britain, you didn't get answer. Shit, pal. Oh, right. It was you already gone. gone. You missed gone, it. You gone. Right. That one's gone. Right, right, right. Okay. That one's gone. So we're going to, we're going to, I, I, I watched, uh, I watched, um, I watched an episode of Bullseye, Tom. I'm okay. gonna go into I'm gonna go into my notes here now, okay? These are three legit questions from Bullseye, okay? So we're playing the board, we're putum, putum, putum. we're landing in it here, okay? Three teams against each other. I right, take a turn, you take a turn, the next person takes a turn. All right. I do. We have to answer these questions. These are real questions, Tom, okay? Okay. You know what, I mean? what was the name of the twenty one year old cavalry horse that survived the Hyde Park bombing? My good God. That's uh no, uh, red no, rum. Why would you? Why would you fucking no. get this, Tom? Fucking hell! Okay, who? What was the horse's fucking? The name? horse's name was Sefton. All right, really? and I don't know. Like this must have been when the, the, whenever this episode aired. This must be like right up there because the lad got it straight away. Like this was like, why are you ask me such a fucking stupid question? Like, what an horse obscure Sefton, an obscure thing to make a big news of out of a bombing. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I had to, I had to look up like the Hyde Park. I kind of knew what the Hyde Park bombing was, and when they mentioned horses, I was like, "Oh yeah, I do actually remember seeing a picture of that." Like the IRA, them boys, they fucking blew up a bomb in Hyde Park and it killed like a dozen soldiers and it killed like twenty horses or something such like that. It was like an atrocity, it was terrible. But apparently, one horse uh, made it out, Tom, and was made like a bit of a national hero, I guess, or like the horse they couldn't bomb or something. Okay, on to the next question, Jerry. This is... <laughs> and 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 that was Sefton, and he Sefton's claim to fame was he survived the Hyde Park bombing, and also they should have brought him on. Bullseye. They should have brought him on at that point. They should have yeah, brought him the, on. Yeah, when they did bully, when they did bully, yeah, 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 yeah. Bring him on the horse in a striped, bu- fucking dart shirt and a fag. So as Jim would say, as, as Jim would say, and it's at this point, Tom, I want to say, every part of 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 this is just baked into my consciousness yeah like the 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 texture of the cards that jim is reading from he's like reading (laughs) you know he's like reading question cards and they're in like a little clear laminate kind of yes um, yeah 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 yeah. a little holder and then when you get something he stands them up in a in a little um dartboard so like they're like these little shards of questions standing up and the, the 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 scoreboards the digital scoreboards the 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 look of everything is just like so fucking baked into my consciousness it, it's unbelievable when what I'm was watching, the I'm line like, what was the line one in the one in the black one in the red oh we get to oh we get to one oh black grand, and one in the grand, red grand, oh, yeah, I, I, oh we're coming oh, i love that. it i love that's it not, that's not that's not that's not you know that's not you know two in the pink one in the sink like you're oh, right yeah, there Come on, move right. Uh, questions. So there's questions. <laughs> questions. Okay. So okay, you didn't get that. Um, what singer made his acting debut in The Man Who Fell to Earth? Uh, uh, fuck. Oh. Fuck it. I don't know, bully. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's 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 my bully there. <laughs> 
It does sound very familiar. That I should. It's 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 David Bowie. You're over two here, Tom. Jesus Christ Almighty! Sorry, bully. My man, my man got that one. Um, uh, they didn't get this next one, Tom. So don't feel bad about this. Uh, what is the name of the weight kept in the hold of a ship to keep it steady? Oh shit! I know that because I once melted down a boat. I... It's yeah, jeez. Well, it's not keel, obviously, but that just keeps it steady. I don't know. I melted down lead with a guy once to actually do it in his ship. He was going seafaring across Europe. What is it called, Jerry? Ballast. Oh, fuck it. It's literally like way. OK, OK. This is a quiz show it's turned into, Jerry. And now I'm violent over fucking over. I want to pick up a set of darts and throw them at something. Well, Tom, <sighs> if we ever go on bullseye, this just proves that you will be the dart thrower. Pal. Oh, I'll be the thrower. Oh, no, I'm OK at darts. I'm OK at darts. I will be the thrower. You can be the knower. So moving on. So this is how the this is how the first round of, of, of quizzing and questioning went, Tom. But like if you were the lowest scoring team at the end of this, you're done. Okay. You're right. You're eliminated. Bye bye. Oh gone. You're, you're gone you're... here. Right, right, right. This is where you're we get gone. rid of them. Ta- okay. No. Thanks for coming along and uh we'll see you back on the picket line. All right. <laughs> but with that being said, we didn't, you know, kick them out of the studio just yet. They might be, uh, they might be coming back in a little while. But what? here's the thing, Tom. Yeah, we we'll, we might be circling back to them in a little second. Okay. But before they went, whatever money they got, usually in the low hundreds, uh, 120, 130 pounds, Jim would, would count that out for them. I love, I fucking loved more physical cash. He it licked was his cash thumb in his pocket. In his pocket. Like, like there was an, an actual uncle fucking buying. So he would lick his thumb and actually peel off and put the rest back in his pocket like it wasn't a yeah. set amount no, he'd it, actually it, have it felt like, maybe five it felt or six like this was Jim's pocket. money <laughs> <laughs> like he was paying you out of I his fucking it. wages Tom and I've never seen that done be- before or never. since I mean it's amazing it makes it so authentic that there's cash money going down on the table in front of you and he damn near spits in his hand and shakes hands at him like exactly I I, love I, it. I, the only thing like I guess in who wants to be a millionaire they've got like a lucite case full of what's supposedly a million euro in cash that you can look at but not touch but that's to be and uh, that in itself that's is like a spectacle prop. that's a spectacle in that it's it's a million quid but Jim peeled off could peel off 90 you put your pound. hand out and he he counted tenors into it <laughs> he could actually peel off 90 pound into your hand like and say yeah. oh well done I could, some of the pri- like some I loved I actually sp- I can remember one before there was a knitting needle set given away. I was like, oh, oh my God, this is fucking beautiful. This is beautiful. This, this is where we are. Yeah. So after after the initial round of questions, Tom, we had a second round of questions, but this was more straightforward, okay? This mm-hmm. was a regulation dartboard, none of your fancy segments or anything right. like that. And uh, the dart player would go up and throw darts at the board and hit a score, whatever it would be, and I would answer a question for that money. Okay. Simple as that. Yeah. And then... The next team would have a go and they would answer questions for that money. And then the following team would, this would go back and forth for, I think, like three rounds a piece. And after all that, if I had more money than you had, Tom, I was yeah. going on to the, I was going on to the prize board and you were going home. Yes. Now the amount Simple of, that. the amount of darts players that you knew were probably decent darts players, but the poor bastards just choked on telly too. Like they, you know, but this I mean? is it. This is bright lights, studio lights. And it has a, it has, it has the studio crowd. And I just want to mention the studio crowd, Tom, we've talked to them a couple of times. It was one of the rare occasions. And I don't believe I've seen it since where the studio audience was on camera at all times. Yeah, that's so, actually really you know, interesting. You'd, there'd be a shot, you know, you'd catch maybe 50 of them or 40 or 50 of them over in the corner, over somebody's shoulder. Yeah, you never see that. It's not a never full see turnaround, so, isn't it? So if you if you imagine, like, if you're watching Winning Streak, for example, for our Irish listeners, and the camera is on Marty and Sinead, isn't that her name? Oh, God, I don't know. Camera's on, on the set, and you know that the live studio audience is there because you're hearing them clapping and shit like that, and every now and then the camera will turn around and see, like, this live studio audience here. It's the same what to do for the late, late. Every now and then you'll get a glimpse of the audience to see that they are. But in actual fact, with Bullseye, the audience were, if you could imagine the whole camera turned around and all the action took place in front of the audience, so the audience were the backdrop. They were constantly there. Yeah, I lo- I actually love that format, and I'd, uh, yeah. I'd love to see it. It'd be interesting to dig it back up again, that style. Do you know what I mean? Well, to have it, it, it would add a fair, a fair bit of weight to it. I think it would, anyway. 
Well, what it made it look more like, Tom, is it made it look more like a sporting event. It made it look more like a game of football. Yes. Where you see the crowd in front of you. Like or you're a at the hockey. Game or, or the Ellie Or you were at the hockey itself. So it, 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 it really sort of said, you know, to anybody watching this, if you wanted to come for a game of um, Trivial Pursuits, if you wanted to come for a game of general knowledge, we have that. But if you want darts, this is darts like it looks like in a darts tournament. Sure, no wonder there was a five-year waiting list. People were actually wanting to get on telly. Yes, exactly. You were you were there on TV, and again, it wasn't quite the style parade, um, but it, you could see that these people were, were were invested, and there was a as we as we go on, Tom. There was a lot of audience participation. Yeah, and indeed, yeah, yeah. Tom, indeed, several times you've heard Jim Bowen say it several times watching Bullseye, like he'd ask a question and then he'd turn around and like quiet in the audience, please, because someone in the audience was oh, just it. Yeah, of course, Sefton, Sefton, <laughs> it's a fucking ballast. It's a Tina. It's, it's a ballast. You bastard. So Jim would uh, Jim would peel off twenties into the hands of the second team, and they would fuck <laughs> off as well. And 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 here's where he would. Uh, here's where normally you traditionally you'd have the break in bullseye. We'll we're going to be. Jim would always sign off and say, "I've got <laughs> these fuckers have won seventy pounds. It's going to take me five minutes to count it. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> like no matter what amount of money it took, it was going to take him." The, the length of an ad break to count it out. Like, are you counting this out in fucking pennies, lad? <laughs> yeah, every single time. And he didn't shy away from the fact that, you see, his tongue was in it, firmly lodged in his mouth. He knew that line was as old as the fucking hills and he used it every time. I love it. Absolutely. I love it. Because it's, 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 do you know what, Tom? Uh, people say we'll get into catchphrases in a minute and people say, oh, I had a lot of catchphrases, but they all served a purpose. They moved the show forward. They explained a rule. Um, there was no wasted motion in this show. We need catchphrases, Jerry. We do. We need we need to think up a couple of yeah. catchphrases. Yeah, otherwise we'll get a half day out with The Undertaker. Hey! Yes! <laughs> That's fine. That's our catchphrase. Half day out with The Undertaker. Perfect. <laughs> we borrowed it. We did. We did. So... Okay, so after we came back, Tom, uh, we had uh, we had a brief interlude. This was this was another curious thing with Bullseye. It was like you know, it was very much like the national lottery. Like they did, you know, so so much of your money goes to charitable good, yes. good organizations around the place. They would have a brief interlude after they came back from the uh, from the break to have a professional darts player of the time, your Jockey Wilsons or your Eric Bristol's of the of the world, and a bunch of other fuckers that I've never heard of, who would come in and they would throw nine darts for charity. Yeah, pounds for points, nine darts for charity. I remember seeing was he the Viking? They called him. He was a like he looked like giant haystacks. This guy, and he came on like his oh God, yeah. His arm was the size of your leg. I don't know how, and the darts were hilarious in his giant hands. Apparently, he would drink up to. T- it was before some huge big like he was at, he was just finishing up and. You know, life was probably finishing on him when the likes of Phil the Power Taylor was coming on, who's long gone now, but he was yes. the first big super. So, well, you know, but this, t- this, tattoos. we go back to it, Tom, like the, the, the darts players and the snooker players of the 80s. Like, you know, there was a reason why bowls never really caught on, like, like snooker or darts, because it was slower and there was no big fuck players. But you had your Alex Hurricane, Harry Higgins with the snooker, and you had Phil the Power Taylor or Eric Bristow. You like these guys were. Yeah. were these were gar- darts players, but then they'd be on um, TV AM in the morning having the crack with Roland Rat, you know? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, yeah, that was the thing. They actually, but I mean, that's that's the same with, same with any, any smart sport boxing producer or boxing promoter will tell you, you have to make a superstar of the person yeah. if you want to bring the sport on. And you know, you and that's to- why sports, some sports lag behind, they make a superstar. You know, the people will watch they'll watch a soccer team that they have no affiliation to because Lionel Messi plays on it. Exactly. That's, and I, you know, and I get it. I, I go, oh, right. You know, I can't wrap my head around not watching a sport from, based on a team that I, uh, they're from the place I'm from. You know, I can't yeah. grasp it, but I completely get it when you make a superstar. Like people will, wa- people watch that shit and they'll, in, and they'll, in and Saudi they'll, Arabia or wherever it was that time. That, not for nothing, Tom, they'll leave their houses and buy a ticket and go see it, you know? Yeah, just because of one guy. And that's 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 what that's where I fell down in my uh, comedy career, Tom, is I didn't build a, uh, build up something. <laughs> <that> people, <laughs> hey, will we go see McBride this, this Saturday night? Huh? 
We go see McBride this Saturday night. Oh, I don't know. There's a 24 hour apple green over here. How's he, <laughs> he going to compete with that? <laughs> How's he going to compete with these New York buffalo wing flavored pieces of pretzel for seven euros a piece? Come on. They get I don't dusty know. All I know where I'm sending my money. So, uh, so, 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 yes, there was a brief little interlude where, and, and not always Tom, a professional Darts player, sometimes they get in like local celebrities. Yeah, or... yeah, 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 yeah. Who have you in to throw darts about the place? And then this was the bit where everybody earned their fucking money. This is the bit where Tony Green stepped up to the plate to 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 commentate his little fucking life off. Okay, Bully's prize board. Yeah. Again, when I tell you, Tom, that the noise of this thing turning around is baked <laughs> into my consciousness. Yeah. The noise of the dartboard rotating to reveal this new board. Bully's prize board was an eight-segment dartboard. Yeah. With eight black segments and eight red segments. Number one to eight. Okay? Uh -huh. You hit a dart into a red segment, you won the prize of that segment. Yeah. You hit it into a black segment, you won nothing. Uh-huh. You threw a dart into the red segment twice, you, you lost won. the prize that you'd just won. Yeah. To sum it up in Jim's catchphrase <laughs> that explained this rule, Tom, would you give it to us? So it's one in the black, one in the red. Nothing in this house works with two in a bed or something to that effect. It was like, you're basically, getting there. You're getting there. You're getting something there. to that effect. It was two in the bed. It's it was allowed. stay out of the black and into the red. Yes. Not in this game for two in a bed. And that was like, you know, yes, it was a simplistic catchphrase, but it explained to you very, very simply. That you uh, you won prizes for hitting the red bits and you won nothing for hitting the black. And if you threw a dart into the red bit twice, you won fuck all. Now, here's Beautiful. where, here's where uh, Bullseye kind of, um, a lot of people remember this and they think it's quite, there's, a, there's an English word that I fucking hate, Tom. What? That word is, that word is naff. Oh, I just, yeah. I, I can't be doing with that. It's very naff. The prizes were very naff. And you know what, Tom? Yeah, you know what? T it, today, when I have a phone sitting beside me that can do uh, more... That can do more than the, the, the computer that went to the fucking moon. Exactly. You know? Then, then maybe some of the prizes on Bullseye seem a little bit naff, if that's what you're going to call them. But to a striking minor, Tom, still reeling from the death of all the horses except Sefton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. These yeah. prizes were incredible uh, they really were and i'm going to take you through bully's prize board here oh, of the episode that i watched and researched and i'm going to give you the eight prizes and then you got a very special prize tom oh you, god yeah if yeah, you yeah. The, if you hit the bullseye right so in one again all this is every single one of them was like that go on every single you give me you give me the in ones in twos and i'll give you the prize okay, okay? One a bone china dinner service, okay, like the bone china that your mom probably still and has the in the house. And the whole audience would go, "Ooh, oh, God, I gotta get some of that bone china." And so, a novelty telephone. Now they say they always said like a novelty telephone, but it would be like a Mickey Mouse telephone or a Garfield yeah. telephone yeah, or something yeah, like yeah. that. But they couldn't say for whatever reason they couldn't say Garfield or whatever like that. Uh, but it would be our hamburger telephone. And I remember when I was more like, you know, if if the phone had push buttons, I thought it was the height of the fucking luxury. We had rotary telephone in our house, welded to the fucking wall. And this thing you could walk around with? Come on. In three. Uh, a dozen fine wines, Tom. Oh, stop. Fine yes, wine. Indeed. I yeah, wonder I mean, so how fine this. I wonder how fine this wine was. But like, it was a dozen wines, Tom, at six pound a bottle. Like, it's going to be seventy, eighty pounds worth of wine. Oh no. Get out to yeah. wine. None is calling. In four. I, I couldn't really figure out what the thing was, but it was like kind of like a kind of like a swing and slide set for for children. Oh, like the, the, the like, little ones. I mean, the little ones. The little ones. And like you know, I, 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 as I was, if I was watching this as a child, I would have fucking spat my tea out. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? That was in number four. In five. A portable typewriter. Oh no! Like you know, that's not a that's not a fucking naff prize in the age. No, it is not. Listen, I've seen fucking hipsters with fucking typewriters. So come on. You know, if you if you need to write, uh, you know, your CV, 
uh, hello, uh, uh, you know, 20 years experience down the mines and I'm looking for a new job. Like, that's what you fucking write it on. A typewriter could literally change your life. But you could, exactly. Because where are you going to go to get something typed up, you know, in a small village or a town or whatever that doesn't have that fucking facility these anywhere? Folk should, these fuckers have never seen a button in their lifetime. Not at all. In six. A table tennis table. Some of them were shite, I will say. In these are all this, this, seven. <laughs> these are all real, real prizes that are uh, that were given out on one episode of Bullseye I hope you I named watched. the one that I watched because uh, in seven, Tom was a lady's sheepskin coat. Oh, be Hey, <laughs> 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 right, where are you going to get one for throwing a dart? That's what I want to know. <laughs> cool. I love that it'll just be one size that they fucking bought, and I'm telling you, Bernadette, you can just fucking take it home and make it work. That's all. I'm I, I, I've I've thoughts on all this, and then you've your, your last one. In eight. eight. Uh, you had a 22 inch color television, as you'd imagine it, Tom. Ooh. Screen on one side, little speaker on the other side. Twist the dial to get it. And a 22 inch tele television, uh, any television as a prize, Tom, is not enough. Any oh, fucking day, no, we're no, 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 all concerned. The, the one I was, the one I watched, uh, I the one that the prize that stuck out to me, and I was in like six, five or six. It wasn't a, down, down the, the. It was a nest of tables. A nest, a nest of tables. Actually, yeah. I, 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 I by it um, for the bullseye. Um, in in the bullseye bully special prize in the bullseye mm-hmm. was a pine uh, like dining table and chairs. So like a good dining table and chairs, like. And can you imagine like if, winning? Can you imagine being from, say, Wigan or, or Sheffield or something? Not saying that it would be better, but you know, there's there's so like because it's Jim Bowen and it's it's whatever. But you win that, and you now have something to talk about in your home place for fucking yeah. ever. Like people talk about getting the Blue Peter badge. Can you imagine getting a full dining room set? Imagine getting you, a fucking Mickey Mouse phone. Where'd you get the Mickey Mouse phone? I, I want it on Bullseye. Fuck. I was on Bullseye. You're literally going to get. I'd be a local celebrity for a week in your the, local the, town. The 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 um the missus uh, the missus is wearing a nice coat. Where'd she get that? Well, you're never going to guess. Bullseye as well. Hey, Here's the thing, Tom. I, here, do you want to put down? Do you want to put down that fine wine that I won on Bullseye? Then let me just pull out a little table for you. Uh, there, yeah. Your own little nest. Yeah. <laughs> here's here's a typewriter. Take minutes. Um, I can I could not find for the life of me, Tom, anywhere. I could not find out. If the two contestants on the team got one each. This is the thing. It was, uh, I asked, um, I typed in, I went, how do, like, say it was two blokes who are mates. And they, because yeah. there was kitchen, there was kitchen units as well. Yeah. Like, how do you split that? And sometimes they just took it and worked it out amongst themselves and sold it somewhere else. Or there was an option a lot of time to just take the value of it because a lot of this stuff wasn't in the studio. Like it wasn't right. round the back. They, it was with the shop. Do you know what I mean? So the yes. shop, the shop would probably get advertising somewhere on the in the credits or something like that. Or so a lot of the time, that's what it was. Because the same same applies to um, where or what's it called nowadays? The winning streak. So you win yes, three yes, fucking yes, yes, cars, yes. and there are three Nissan Notes. And you're like, well, I don't fucking want even one Nissan Note. Thank you very much. I'll take a Nissan Note. You fucking don't have to, Jerry. They'll offer you the ca- the cash moolah for that. So if a Nissan Note is eighteen thousand. You got 30, you know, you got fucking three Nissan notes cash instead. Well, all, all this to say, all this to say now, you got mm. nine darts to win nine prizes, okay? Um, three, three, and three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dart player first. So you're the dart player on this. Oh, yeah, game, this is where they, ch- yeah, this is where they, they, they yeah. yes. You got the, well. you got the first three goes, and then I got the middle three because I'm the non dart player, and then you got the final three. Yeah. Okay. Now, here's the thing with the teams in Bullseye, okay? You had one experienced dart player. Yeah. And you had one person who seemed to have never held a dart in their life. I know. Yeah. Who, ne- who didn't know which end of it to throw at the board. Like, Tom, if I was going on, like, any show whatsoever, if I was going on, like, you know, 
bullseye for example or uh total wipeout or whatever it would be you'd train a little bit right no i would say right for i'm taking 70 percent. i'm hiring for 30 percent a fucking parkour expert to go and wipe out yeah you're, you're gonna fucking nail it and i'm not even gonna take a fucking mark i'm hiring uh phil the power taylor's fucking brother to go on and put on an irish accent but Are you fucking joking me? This Dad. thing ran for fucking 14 years, Tom. And even in the later days, the non-dar player would get up as if they were like, oh, fuck, I forgot I had to throw darts. <laughs> Every time. And oh, they, God. I think it was the honesty of people that they just felt like it was, in this, you know, almost speaking to the church. If you're going up, tell it, you've got to be honest. You can't be fucking going, you know. So they go, no, 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 no. One, one player, one, one thrower, one Noah. Simple right. as that. And Simple as that. That's the law, according to James and, Bowen. And 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 that was that was like real compelling TV that they were literally throwing um, darts for prizes. You could. It was very very rare that you would sweep all nine. Almost impossible to sweep all nine because inevitably the non dart thrower would fucking hit the wire yeah. and the dart would ski off into the uh, <laughs> audience, sticking somebody's skewers. knee. <laughs> like that's the way I think everybody was wearing Deirdre Barley glasses. Tom, it wasn't yeah, for vision; it was fucking... for fucking protection. <laughs> they were fucking goggles. <laughs> so now we're into it. Okay, so let's say you'd won a bunch of prizes, Tom. Let's say you won a a, a, a table tennis set and a fucking television. I want to win the television. The television. You've you've. Won I want all. the nest of tables as well. Can I have that? This is where you go to the big finale, Tom. Okay. This is where you play for Bully Star Prize. Okay. Yeah. You ain't, you ain't gonna get it for free. Okay. You have to decide if you want to gamble the prizes you've just won oh against one big super duper prize, or keep the prizes that you've won and just fucking cut your houses and go on yeah. business. Now the money that you won earlier, say if you won three hundred pounds sterling earlier in the game, the that's Jim counted out. You keep that in your pocket. That's yours, and you get. Your little trinkets that you take home, your tankards and your 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 um. There was a pen. There was a pen and 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 there was like fucking novelty darts or, or I beg your pardon, bullseye branded darts and a bendy bully, and oh, a bendy, on, bendy bully. That's right, a wee bendy bully. You could have all that. You, in I believe in later episodes in the nineties, you had to gamble the whole fucking pot. Ah, but fuck. for the ones I remember as a child, uh, you could keep the money that was yours. But you were gambling your fucking bone china set. You were gambling everything for 101 or more in six darts. Three darts each for 101. If you got 101 or more, you won Bully's special prize. Jesus Christ. And this is where the audience participation really came in because you had the time for the board to revolve. And I remember the noise of that board revolving from <laughs> the audience yelling, gamble, gamble. Jim would be like, what do you want them to do? Gamble, gamble. Everybody was like, gamble. No, not a person was going like, no, nah, you're all right. Keep it. Yeah. And when yeah, it yeah. turned around, Jim said, what are you going to do? And if they wanted to gamble, they gambled. But if they didn't want to gamble, a lot of the times it was, look, we've had a lovely day, Jim. We've won more than we thought we'd win. Um, Wife will kill me if I go home without this sheepskin coat. It was always, yeah, the wife will kill me. We're not going to, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to go for it. And Jim would bid them farewell. And this is Tom, where he would bring in the previous contestants, the ones that we said bye bye to earlier. Remember I told you that they didn't fuck off home? Yeah, 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 yeah. He would bring them in and ask them if they wanted to have a go at the prize board. Now, Tom, they hadn't won any prizes yet. They might have won like 120 pounds earlier in the day that's in their pocket that's not in their pocket they have to gamble that against oh, the bully star jesus christ jim this is fucking this is inhuman this is genius tv that's like, great that's great and now this this is where you could lose your bollocks you could go home with nothing you could go home tom with the infamous bfh the bus fare wasn't it wasn't it? the uh, bus fare home the bus fare home that's it yeah 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 and 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 this like you know everybody <laughs> says like you know that's that I, I watched that evolve as a catchphrase because I, I watched that o- develop over years because he said bus fare home like every so often oh yeah not a, not a done thing but then in later years he said it like every fucking week and then in later years again he said your BFH every single week and, he, and every week he'd say your BFH you know what that is and I was like yeah Jim I've been fucking watching you do this for six years but <laughs> But everybody fucking knows what it is. This is where you could 
lose your bollocks. And if you'd won £120 and you didn't want to, you know, spend that or lose that, Tom, you could decline. Okay. And it would go to the people that got kicked out in the very first round. Who won fuck all. Who won £40 or less. Whatever oh, it was yes. they yeah, won. Yeah, 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 and they, yeah. would, they would inevitably gamble. I don't, believe they ever, I don't believe the show ever went off the air with everybody going, nah, you're all right, Jim. Yeah. Um, but Bowen went on to tell a tale, anecdotal as it may be, that there were people who won 20 sterling and got, uh, you know, knocked out in the front in the first round. But when it came to gamble, they were like, nah, we're not going to gamble. He goes, look, I'll give you fucking 20 pound out of my pocket. <laughs> if you gamble, if you don't. Just for fuck's sake. We've no Christ end to it. Yeah. And just peels one off. I'll, yeah, I'll put another, it down. My own there's money. There's score there. My own money. Otherwise, we've no we've no end to the show. We can't just turn around and go like, well, we've had a good day today. Uh, so you threw 101 or more darts with that drum roll, that kettle drum roll, Tom. Oh, my God. Uh-huh. I, can hear it. I can hear the rumble of it. Uh, non-dart player up first who would hit treble three twice and then scale the dart off the side of the board. Or yep. on occasion, there's a wonderful clip going around on YouTube of a lady that just walks up and fucks darts at the thing, just like completely blind. And yes. scores 117, just like yeah. two darts. Um, and you would win Bully Star Prize, which was usually one of three things. Um, a holiday to Mallorca, rarely yeah. anywhere else. Yeah. Mallorca was, I guess, just like the destination at the time. Uh, you could win a car, Tom. Yeah. A modest car, Tom. Fiat Uno, I saw once. <laughs> <laughs> A modest car from like several now defunct uh, car brands, I would imagine, like a Morris. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a, yeah, whatever yeah, the yeah. fuck. The Morris be. Metro. There was a Morris Metro as well. Yeah, yeah. one of these little fucking dudes. Yeah. Or Tom, you could win a speedboat. Oh, I love the fuck and the speedboat. Like <laughs> the fucking speedboat cracked me up every time because it have it down at a, at a jaunty angle as well. Like it's making a hard bank. Yeah, it's making a hard, a hard bank. turn. Yeah, and. Like these people are not. What the fuck are they gonna do? With, and it was a tiny little speedboat too. Like like two good sized girty men are not gonna fucking fit in this thing. No, but and, and it kind of looked. It reminded me of. Do you know those ones when you you go to those parks? A lot of them in the UK where kids can actually sit on their little, you know, their little boat. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a, yeah I, I dare say if we go back to our action park episode from season yes, six, it's like the fucking speedboats that tip you out into snake infested waters. That's exactly what I'm seeing, and it's, it was the jaunty angle that it was always at. And yes. it was, and they're t- these people don't have the sea. They were like, I saw one one crowd. They wanted from Tamworth, and apparently Tamworth is two it's two hours from the nearest fucking water source. It's like, what the fuck are you gonna put it in? But they're in invariably. They, well, one one can assume that you could take a cash alternative to this, but I'll tell you, I, I heard hope one, so. Yeah, um, I heard one sort of anecdotal story that. Um, that the makers of Bullseye were in tight with like a speedboat manufacturer or some shit. And he was just like, you get my speedboats on the TV. I'll give you all the fucking speedboats you want, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Tom, that was it. Okay. If you got 101 or more in six starts, you won the prize. You won the caravan or the fucking whatever it was. If you didn't win, Jim would say, Let's have a look at what you could have won. Yeah. That fucking brought you Cruel over. Cruel bastard, like. And then wheel out, like, you know, a car you're never going to be able to afford. And we're like, yeah, that's terrible. But you've had a good day. You've lost all your prizes from Bully Starboard. You know, you're going home with, like, a set of darts, which one would assume you own a set of darts to begin <laughs> yeah. with. But thanks for coming, lads, and I'll see you next week. And that was it. He would fucking wave at the camera. And he would have you out the fucking door and gone. Yeah. Because it's tits and teeth and then out the fucking gap. That's all it is for Jim. He's a fucking, he's a grafter. He's out. out the gap. He's a car warmed up around the side. As he said himself, uh, like the, you know, the show was shit. It was a piece of shit for 14 years, but we always drove home, drove home in a Bentley. So fuck yeah. So what <laughs> can know? he do? Well, uh, and, 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 and there you go, Tom. That was it. That was, that was, that was, you just repeat that 356 times and you have the original 1981 to 1995 run of Bullseye. They gave um, it another crack, though, didn't they? With um... well, they did. They did. I mean, like, and 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 I want to tell you one thing, Tom. That it, I, I I did a bit of research, and it wasn't cancelled. Nobody said, "All right, fuck you, bulls! I go go and shite." Nobody's watching you anymore. We don't want you anymore. It wasn't that it was cancelled. They just kind of wrapped it up. Um, when I say three hundred fifty-six episodes, Tom, in at its peak, 
in the 80s, Bullseye was drawn 17 million viewers. Fucking hell. Okay, and I just, I just, I just, I did a little a few sums for comparison. Now, the BBC coverage, I'm pretty sure that, you know, if you add up Sky and RTE and whoever was showing it, it would come to more of that. But just on its own, the BBC coverage of King Charles's coronation there the other week uh -huh. peaked at 15 million. Fuck off. So Jim well, Bullseye has drawn 17 million. And that was it, Tom. I mean, like people, we always laugh, oh, we only had six channels, we only had this, we only had that, but we really only did. So it was like you were watching one of these six things at this time every week. And the vast majority of people decided, you know what? That quiz show with the host that, you know, can't make it through a question without getting a getting a word wrong. Uh <laughs> and the darts players, half of them can't fucking don't know what where the hockey is. Uh that's what we want to watch. We I, want to see these fuckers win speedboats. Do you know what though? It was on at the perfect time. It would because it, it, it's not a midweek one where you're still kind of in work mode and you're still. It's one where you're completely fucking devoid of any of any resistance. Do you know what I mean? You're not going watching after a big feed. You've had dessert and everything. You're supping a drop of tea. You can't go watching fucking uh, Breaking Bad. You know what I mean? You can't, you, Jesus. No, give me some brain chewing gum. That's what I need right now. And that's what it was. Absolutely. A apparently. And, and, appar and even at that, like, you know, it's 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 it's, it's the kind of thing that you, you have other game shows that are, are kind of like very involved in all this thing, like that fucking cube thing where it's like throw a tennis ball into oh, a cylinder 30 feet. Right I'm like, I don't know. I, I wouldn't know what muscle to twitch to do that. Throw a dart at a board. That I can do. That I can do. Uh, there's another game show. I don't know what it's called, but I see it on there sometimes during the day. And it's basically. Um, Is it the slot machines? The, the, it's the, the slot machine where you drop a push coin in the. Oh, fuck the, the, off. The push hapenny, drop a drop a coin yeah. down and it pushes coins off. And I'm like, yeah, the, the fucking thing I used to play out in the arcades in Black Rock and Dundalk, they made a fucking TV show. Where out you'd of walk that? by and purposely just swing your arse into it just to so see could you knock a few coins out? Yeah. No, 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 no. But that's just it's it's just so simple and so easy to get. Like, you know, I can I can I can appreciate why it's and I will say if you I think it's called Tip and Point that show. If you're watching it and there's coins hanging off the side, you're like, oh, I'm gonna fucking watch the rest of this, see if the <laughs> I, I guess but there's something there was something twee and cute, I think, about um about Bullseye more so than the actual what it was. The it was darts or whatever. There was something for me. When there's so many elements like you broke them down there where the audience are on display like it's a sporting event, the people are so coy and so shy. The darts players themselves are like, you know, the the, the, the people who are apparently good at darts, they often shit the bed and got what's known oh, as yeah. dart, dartitis where you just can't even let, let go of the art, dart bit correctly sometimes. I love, and the prizes, apparently the notion was that the funding was so poor for it that that's why, and they became a novelty then you know, they'd actually give away a pencil set earlier in the show so that they could top load paying for the telly and then as the tables yes. later on in it because it just the cash wasn't there. So they went, do we spread it, spread the love throughout or do we buy really silly shit ones at the start at the top? And then we, you know, we've got a fucking speedboat. We can't give away like a load of fucking 22 inch televisions, you know, so it'll be, yeah, a phone for our tenor and a TV. G Jim had a great anecdote. Uh, I watched an interview with him and he was, he was asking you know how he had no he had no good words to say about it other than that he loved it and but it was terrible he's like yeah. the first season should have been cancelled only it cost nothing it should have been cancelled so he said I was so bad but he said here's the thing the, the what I, why he believed it was kept on is that the suicide rates in the north of England apparently were really high at the time now I don't know was was this a tongue in cheek joke I don't think it was he said it quite sincere, sincerely and he said all they had on telly to distract him was songs of praise and this other thing that sounded familiar but it sounded just like terrible and they slotted us in between apparently suicide he said it apparently suicide rates in the north of England came down because people would sit down to go oh this is worth watching and it would, we would break that cycle for people and people the suicide rates actually came down in the north of England as a result of Bullseye and he believes that's the what? only reason it was kept on because it was terrible the whole thing was terrible he was terrible the guests were terrible. <laughs> the prizes were terrible. The actual game concept of the game, terrible. But he said, at the same time, 
we possibly saved some people's lives and I drove home well, eventually. you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll take that. And I'll tell you what wasn't terrible, Tom, was the viewership because even around about 1995 when the cat, when um, the plug was eventually pulled on Bullseye, I tell you, they didn't get cancelled. They were pulling in 10 million viewers on a Saturday night. It, it, it moved from like um, Sunday to Saturday. I, ca- I kind of seem to recall it being on like before Gladiators or some such, but certainly like before the blind dates of this world, you had your Bullseye. Uh, 10 million uh, viewers and they went to the maker of it, the, the originator of it, the guy called Andrew Wood that we mentioned yeah. back up the way and said, okay, look, you know, we're still doing all right, but we want to modernize Bullseye. We want to make a few tweaks. We want to make a few changes. It's the 90s. It's not the 80s. You're still using the old set. You still got all the old faces. So we're going to make a couple of tweaks here just to pull it dragging and screaming into 1995. And he goes, nah, I'm out. Nah, we're good. Yeah, just take it. I don't want it. We've all made a lot of money. Uh, I don't know what the fuck it is you're intending to make, but nah, you're grand. Fuck I you. love that. I love that. A lot to be said for it. I love that the man knew when he had enough money. I just went, look, you, you just fucking, you do you, you do you, because I'm not being involved in this. It was, it was a beautiful thing we created and it lasted 14 years. You rock on. Because Dave Spikey, who's a who's a yeah, charming that, character that was the in thing himself, that, like yeah, he did it, didn't he? And I, I Dave Dave Spikey's a decent comedian, and he was of like you know Phoenix if you squint Knights, at that, yeah, and you yeah. might say, is that yeah, is that Northern comedian Jim Bowen? No, it's Dave Spikey, uh, who you may know from Phoenix Nights, everybody. He came back to host a revival of Bullseye in two thousand and six uh, for I want to say like. Um, Challenge UK or one of these sort of oh yeah would be yeah, up yeah. in the high sixties channels you know that it, it cost cost fuck all to bring it back um and they brought it back for thirty episodes and the best anybody has to say about it is that it was fine <laughs> uh, it was by all means grand it kept the same format of the show bar a couple of tweaks and a couple of new catchphrases from Dave uh, Tony Green was still there on the hockey calling out the numbers. The, the, the concepts, the, the look and feel of it was all the same, but whether it was just that in 2006, people were just like, yeah, I'm not having it. It, it didn't really, uh, it didn't really set the world on fire. And the thing that was missing from it as well, Tom, not for nothing, we've mentioned there that if Dave Spikey was presenting it, where the fuck was Jim Bowen? Yeah. Where was Jim, Jim Bowen? Bowen? Jim Bowen at that stage had retired from show business is the official line on it. Uh, Jim Bowen went on after Bullseye to have like a local radio show in the morning on some BBC affiliate in the kind north of, of England, like, one could assume. It kind of sounds a bit like Alan Partridge, you know, like. Exactly, yeah, yeah he got some early like, morning radio show. and as and Radio kind of Norwich. Run, radio Norwich, we're in about 2002. I kind of remember this happening, Tom, that he thought his mic was off and he, uh, he came out with some... Um, uh, he described some lady in a in an incredibly racist uh, fashion, and uh, and that was Jim Bowen. That was it for Jim. Do you remember the same thing happened to fucking what do you call it? Ron Atkinson, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty much the exact same thing. I remember these things happened to a couple. Andy yeah. Gray as well got it as well. Like you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, didn't the know their mics guy, yeah, yeah. on and let their true feelings be known about a couple of things, and people were like, nah, you know, you'd be, oh, you'd be all right. yeah. Um, so that was in 2002. So he quote unquote retired from show business after that, but like he was still doing like his little stand up tours and, you know, doing this kind of thing, but like not for nothing. He was fucking old man at that stage. He was 70 years of age. It was probably time to tip on and retire, but I dare say they would have gotten them all things being equal. They probably would have gotten them back for the bullseye revival, even though in his own words, he thought the show wasn't all that very good to begin with. But that's the thing, like, I mean, also, maybe he knew when he had enough, too, like, because fuck me, you make it sound, <clears throat> excuse me, you make it sound handy, but like 30 weeks out of the year, doing it, like, it wasn't a half an hour, you know, it wasn't, it was going to no, be. No, you know, you know, in your heart and soul, like, you know, he says, oh, we only worked for three weeks out of the year and you got your 30 episodes. And I'm like, yeah, but you're uh, yeah. Get three of these fucking things a day, like, that's no easy joke. You'll be dead after the three weeks. And yes, indeed. you'll be prepping and... e- either side of the three weeks for three weeks as well. You'll be dying after the three weeks and then you know you, you fucking hell. yeah it's great great gig to get but i guarantee it fucking burst him and no man in his 70s wants to be cracking into that and yeah. i'm, you, you I'm know, not i know i'm not pa- i'm not giving the guy a pass or anything for coming out with that racist stuff but he's an old northern guy you know who's a comic who's probably trying to make somebody laugh in the room too with some you know fucking terrible remark 
I mean, like, it's, you know what? It's, yeah, it's I mean, not, it's not, you know, it's it, when he was, as the fellow, you know, as there's plenty of comics to say, like when he was a child, when he were a lad, you know, it was literally the Second World War. You know what I mean? Like, it was, it was. Yeah, well, you know what, Tom? When I was a lad, I was only 11 years away from the moon landing. <laughs> 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 but yes, uh, you know, um, Jim, at, at, in 2006, he moved on from a Bullseye. And then in 2012, he moved on from life. Yeah. Because he fucking died at the age of 80. I believe the man took a bunch of strength. Grand. Grand uh, but Tony Green, quiet spoken Tony Green, he's still alive, Tom. Still on the go, is Tony. Tony is 84 and he still commentates on the darts. Of course he does. Of course. He does. Yeah, of course he does. I've listened. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, yeah, he's not going to get into botany all of a sudden. Jesus. No, I know he'd comment. I know. I definitely have, have listened to him or, you know, I've, I've heard him while watching yeah, darts. Yeah, and it's the, si- it's the same, it's the same silky tones. Um, wow. That, that you remember, you know, because uh, that was the one thing about Tony and indeed about Jim as well, Tom, it has to be all said, like, you know, uh, they were encouraging. Like they wanted you to win this money, Tony. Would if you were up to the hockey on for the non dart player, they would, yeah, 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 like, yeah. Take your time, you have all the time in the world, relax, just take your time and throw. Jim would be like, Okay, do your best. They wanted these people to win money, they, they really did. did. And it was, they did, yeah. It's, 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 it's uncommon. Um, it's, it was uncommon and it was nice and, and it was, uh, it was good to see. But I'll tell you one thing before we wrap up on Bullseye, Tom. There's a couple of stories here about Bullseye. Uh, the one that comes up time and time again, and I kind of knew it a little bit, but for those that have never heard of it, Bullseye was instrumental in catching a serial killer. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Go on, please tell this one. Yeah. Yes, indeed. There was a, 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 I guess Jim would call him a wrong one. Yeah, a wrong one. It would be a wrong one. A, a real wrong one called John Cooper, who appeared in Bullseye in the mid 80s uh, in between bouts of double murder. He killed two people. Uh, in the years beforehand, went in bullseye and went on to kill two people in the months after it. And people were chasing down who it was to kill these four people. He was a fucking no good Nick, a real, a real fucking piece mm-hmm. of shit, right? Uh, a real Terry Duckworth. Uh, he was a, he was just a bad one, right? Uh, but investigators in 2011, I want to say, 2012, when they were building the case against this guy, John Cooper, they were like, we fucking know it's this guy. We just know we need a couple of extra bits of evidence to build the case. Like, we need to know where he was in 1985. And someone said, I don't know he was. That fucker was on bullseye. I thought, get out of town. Because, yeah, he was on bullseye. So they looked up the episode of him on yeah. Bullseye, and there he is, John Cooper in '85 on Bullseye. I was like, and like, I'm I'm, I'm paraphrasing it here, uh, Tom, <laughs> but like, it's 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 almost as basic as Jim goes from. So if you hadn't planned for the weekend, and he's like, oh, I'm just going over to the coast here. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to mill around the coast for a couple of days. Brilliant, <laughs> you fucking <laughs> tip. Amazing. And it's like, you know, hang on a second. You're going to the coast for a couple of days. Let me just line up the things. And they looked at him uh, on Bullseye. And he looks like, uh, he, he, he looks like, you know, the Harry Enfield Liverpoolians. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he looks yeah, like that. Yeah. He's got the curly hair and the mustache. And then they look at the, the identikit that was from an eyewitness report in 1985 of like this mysterious man that's seen hanging around. But the cops had no way of knowing in 2012 what. John Cooper looked like in 1985. They had an identikit, but they couldn't match it up to him. Yeah. And then they're like, let me just hold this identikit picture up to, to him on side. Both side. And <laughs> side by side, it's just the fucking, it, they, they couldn't get over it. It's like, it's like he was sketched in court. It's, it's literally the same, man. And that is how John Cooper, to this day, is uh, facing life without the possibility of parole. Oh, fucking hell. The condition will get die more in wholesome. jail. Look Good what he God. Huh? Good God. There was, there's, uh, for, there's actually a similar story. It's about an American t- guy, a comedy. God, well, it wasn't the Larry Sanders show. What was it? It wasn't, oh, it wasn't always sunny. Shit. Why can't I think of it? It's that older guy with the glasses, very funny Jewish guy. Always rambling around and cranky. God, I can't remember the name of the show, but it's on Netflix, a documentary where a guy was just, this Hispanic chap was just picked up. They just went, you murdered this fella. He went, I fucking didn't. I was at a baseball game at the Jordan to prove it. Where'd you take Oh, it? shit, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like a million, it's in the off, it's in the, um, 
It's in the deleted scenes of Curb Your Enthusiasm or something. Curb Your Enthusiasm, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. By pure fluke, some which way they found that Curb Your Enthusiasm was filming at a live baseball game that day and they, it was just a point where they kind of had left the camera running. It was, And it was, they'd done the take a few times is where Larry's walking up the, whatchamacallit, he's walking up along the steps of the bleachers. And, 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 and there he is, yeah. And there's the guy with his son who had yeah. been accused of being more, and he, it was during that game was when he would, so again, it was much like the Bullseye story. That's incredible. Have you any more stories for me on Bullseye? I have. I the only other thing I have about Bullseye is its legacy in the terms of turn-based sports meets general knowledge uh, quiz shows, Tom. Because although we didn't get a revival of Bullseye in the nineties, its legacy was kind of carried on on the BBC uh, yeah. with like the clearest fucking ripoff of a show I've ever seen. So yeah, we're after spending an hour and some change there talking about uh, Bullseye Tom, but we're not going to spend all that long talking about Big Break, which was the BBC's equivalent. You God, take out darts, a, you fucking stick in snooker. To be honest, it was so seamless and it was so easy on the eye that I don't think at the time I spotted it that it was an absolute ripoff. It was just like, oh yeah, this makes sense. This makes absolute sense. You have questions and snooker and John Vergo replaces Tony Green. I do like John Vergo. I like John uh, Vergo, yeah. You replace one um, uh, comedian in the form of uh, Jim Bowen with Jim Davidson. And then he can go off and have his own racism <laughs> adult future. <laughs> I mean, it's like literally fucking the twin peaks of Bullseye is big. Yeah, link. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, That's exactly it. But and, and and I dare say if they if they could have made a lawn bowls uh version of it called I don't know the T the long roll my, <laughs> my, the long roll my fucking my 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 creative juices are gone at this stage Tom I don't know what Jacks any are other, yellow I don't know I, don't, I, I genuinely don't know any other um there's I I I was racking my sport. brain because I was like obviously cards I was thinking pub base because that's when when we were talking about it, I was like well pub base is what it has to be because you want the same clientele. And, you know, a good pub will have a snooker table, but every pub has a pool table. But it's, you know, same thing, only fucking different. And here's one for you. And it, it's a kid's game that you've probably bought for your kids, but it's actually a very, it, I don't know if it originated, but it's, it's taken as a very serious game in parts of Cork. Oh, yeah. It's rings. I was just going to say, get a fucking rings. ring board. Get rings. a ring board up there and ask a couple of questions and you peg. Rings are, uh, rings are, is a game. And I did, I'd heard my brother-in-law, who's a very accomplished darts player. He's played on county teams and everything for Cork. Um, he's played all the time when I lived down there. I just, yes, just yes, started yes. to enjoy it because it was, it was a good excuse to have pints. Um, wow. <laughs> not that I needed an excuse, but you know what it was? You could, I could document my pints. I, I could put a graduation on my pints. Whereas in my 20s, I could drink all the pints if I had no right. leash and darts was a handy leash because you'd keep yourself somewhere right because we were playing for, you know, fivers and tenors and stuff like that against other people. Of course. Um, so it was good for me in that sense. But then rings was mentioned to me. I went, go oh, wait. Fuck. And I, we actually haven't like it, it has to be an, it considered antique at this stage here somewhere in the parents attic. It would have been it was my mother's family who are from Kilkenny it was their rings thing but I went it's not played in pubs and he goes oh fuck yeah 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 and lo and behold I took him at his word then one particular summer I was working for this builder who he had me labouring and I went out to this pub we were doing up the lounge and it was one of those pubs Jerry that the guards never visit Owlful yes. started like nine in the morning the owner's a milkman as well so he never sleeps he just goes right. on cider and fucking crisps <laughs> and this very first morning I'm ripping down the ceiling or whatever in the lounge pit and I hear this click 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 I'm like what the fuck is that what kind of, how, I'm thinking they're playing cards the loudest game of snap ever and stick my head around the door and there's a load of owl lads fucking money up on the table playing rings and I'm like are they just giving it a go because somebody brought in a ring board Turns out when I looked at it properly, it was framed in on the wall. The fucking rings had their proper, proper little, you know, little stick sticking out of the wall that you hung your rings on. Like, oh, it's it's a piece of piss. And I remember going out to play the bar owner like one of the days. It is not a piece of piss at all. Not if you're trying oh, no. to win. No, not if no, you're trying I'm... to win. The amount of mine that just swung around that little hook and fucked off across the floor. 
because they're rubber. It's real rubber. You yeah. Can't, you can't play with timber. You can't play. With, it's actual from the rubber tree rubber. You know, like uh, a chap in Africa may have lost an arm as a result of one of these fucking rings. Like, yeah, do you know, for you to be playing there. Well, the tomorrow. Belgians, you know, that was their thing back in the day. I'm just saying like, but um, I was when you said it to me, I went rings would absolutely fucking only it's not so if you, generally if you'd have heard them you, you'd have heard them boys there playing away the rings at that stage Tom if you just darted in and go real quick I'll give you a tenor if you tell me the name of the fucking horse right <laughs> trust me double. we were in we were in Bail the Blow Jerry those fuckers would have known the name of the horse and the amount of fucking horses that were fucking yeah. killed I can promise you that we were in we we're about five miles from Bail the Blow yeah you mean the horse um, we didn't get yeah that's the one yeah yeah uh, He'll be good, and, uh, and 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 that was it. I, just as you mentioned, as you mentioned, the pub sports of it all, Tom. That really, I think, was the appeal of Bullseye. Like it really, yeah. it it felt Jim hosting the show, uh, and his mannerisms and his and his kind of charm and his, his he lost control every now and then of the crowd a little bit and yeah. had to get them back on track. It really felt like a pub owner trying to get everybody to shush for a minute so he could do the raffle. Yeah, but come here, I I. I remember, I remember being, you know, in a pub as a child and it being on the television over the bar and everybody loving it. Yeah. Loving it. Right. Like watching it like fuck. And then as soon as it was over, give us out and people either had their own darts or there was the house darts and the fucking dartboard would be lit up for the fucking night after it. Much like Wimbledon, everybody would bust out the fucking tennis rackets flaking balls across this you know tar- if you had a, if your neighbor had a tarred fucking driveway you were all over to that because yeah. we only ever had stones and that was fuck all use for a tennis ball but yeah, 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 it was yeah, the yeah. same thing would inspire jesus you, you know yeah. off you go but it was it was worthy of keeping a pub crowd entertained because it was just a home away from home you know and what i mean it was it was worthy of an episode a season starter at that of the tom and jerry show indeed well done we there we up, go. Folks. We wrapped up at a reasonable time too. Yeah, how about that? We'll we'll try and not keep that up. Um, <laughs> so Tom, there you go. People may have forgotten, or people just ignored us the first time. What do we want them to do if they like the Tom and Jerry? Well, show? first and foremost, uh, follow us on all the usual platforms. Jerry McBride, Tom O'Mahony, you'll find us. But let us know your maybe your nostalgic show from your childhood, whether it's the eighties, nineties, or seventies, or sixties, whatever era you're from. If you have memories of of bullseye please please send us on pictures let us know yeah if if we were idiots and missing out and all the action that was going on on songs of praise at the time please let us know do 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 but in the meantime if you, whatever platform you are listening on whether it be spotify most of you are on spotify i think it's at like 95 percent at this stage give it the five stars anything less than that is oh God, use but what it'll do for us is it'll spike us back up again because we've been on a bit of hiatus and people will start seeing it again and joining in the show other than that, there's nothing much else to do other than maybe share it, tell people about it, do a screen grab, let us know where you're listening to. If you have any debates on the thing, like, ah, lads, you are fucking way off there for Jesus. Please do tell us because you're going to have ample opportunities to talk to us throughout this season because there's going to be a lot of things that's going to make you do that. And I promise you, Jerry McBride and I will definitely fucking answer you. (laughs) We, oh, yeah. oh, without and shadow, we will without di- shadow. We are the sort that will dig our heels in even if we're absolutely wrong and we find out we're wrong. We will not back down because we're ignorant. We have interesting uh, hair and we have our views. Just saying. Is that mic turned off, Jerry? Anyway, well, like I was saying about that. Fu- <laughs> <laughs> there we go. One episode into season seven and we both sides uh, Bernard Manning. Didn't see that one coming. Um <laughs> We will see you next week with an equally obscure but very fun subject that we will deep dive, tear apart, have a look in underneath, maybe put the bonnet back down and call an actual professional yes, on the indeed. whole situation. <laughs> and, 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 and this whole season, I dare say, Tom will indeed be super smashing great in the words of Jim Bowen, although he was adamant that he never fucking said that. Here's the thing with super smashing great before you go on. He absolutely did say super smashing great. Yes, he, he, just never said, he just never said them all in the row. Things were either super or smashing. Or great. Or great. But he never said super smashing great. Listen, he's been Jeremy McBride. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Super <laughs> smashing great. He's been Tom O'Mahony. Fuck me, yeah. <laughs> Rusty wheel, Tom. What can I say? That's all right. Till next week. Um, yeah. 
Don't let the door hit you where the good Lord put you.